I recently received an email from NDP MLA Brenda Bailey proudly proclaiming that her government had introduced as their first bill legislation that would forever enshrine the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation as a provincial statutory holiday in BC. Now, with respect to the merits of this bill, which I'll get to in a moment, what about the financial cost? As a taxpayer, I'm now going to be paying for more to get even less. It's not like we don't already have enough freaking provincial holidays. Now we have two in September for which I will be paying government employees to sit at home. No wonder these clowns like Brenda in Victoria can never get anything done other than squander cash. All right, by now all the progressive leftist wokesters, if there are any who actually watch me, are muttering, that a-hole, all he cares about is money. That's white supremacy for you. Not so, my friends. What I take offense to is how those who supported this measure characterized it as a way, and I quote, for speaking up for those who suffered in the residential school system and for the kids who never returned home. In attendance in the, during the event in the gallery was Phyllis Webstead, who was a catalyst for this legislation. How so? Well, she shared her story of how as a child she had her orange shirt that her grandmother bought for her violently taken away on her first day of residential school which ultimately, this was the catalyst for her founding the Orange Shirt Day to raise awareness about the injustice that Indigenous children were forced to endure. Okay, so now we have Phyllis's story. Credible? I don't know. I wasn't there. I guess I just have to take her word for it. By doing so, though, are we then acknowledging that this was the experience of all residential school children? Does Having your shirt taken away qualify as genocide? Is this the worst that could have happened? Now, do we apply this to children in school today? If one child has a negative experience in some way, shape or form with either a teacher or a fellow student, do we simply say all children are bound to have had the same experience? We all know the answer to that question. Now, setting aside Phyllis's personal story, what I really wanna focus in on is the end of that earlier statement. I mentioned, particularly the line for the kids who never returned home. I really find statements like this disingenuous, divisive, and aimed at eliciting maximum guilt, especially amongst white folks, especially when they're not supported by the facts, because this statement would lead you to believe that these residential schools were basically genocidal death camps. What else could you take away from a statement like that? Now, if you're truly interested in the history and operation of Canada's Indian residential school, you're fortunate because now you can consult the new carefully organized and meticulously documented WordPress website called Indian Residential School Records. It is now freely available for anyone and who's interested in pursuing and learning from and citing what actually happened during this time. The website augments, even replaces much of the haphazardly organized, incomplete and biased material found on the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, the NCTR site, based on the deliberations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, the TRC, which was charged with reporting on the history, operation and legacy of Canada's indigenous boarding schools. This new exhaustive site was launched December 19th of last year. And this online WordPress archive has a section called the Indian Residential School Records, put together by independent researcher, Nina Green. With this new research tool, Green has created a place where her prolific uh, archived research on many carefully hidden aspects of the IRS system is freely available to you and I for consumption. This is a major development for researchers seeking accurate information about the IRS system during the time it actually operated, not decades later, as are the testimonies of all the survivors in the TRC report. The most important feature of this website is that it contains a mountain of original historical material collected while the boarding schools were still in active operation, like I said, not decades later. And many of these primary documents go back to the origin of these boarding schools 
And these documents were never either consulted or basically brushed aside by the TRC. The site contains numerous files, technically called pages, uh, some dedicated to administrative records, such as school applications, students, medical and death records, student reunions, and student activities. There is even a separate page devoted to the controversial Kamloops uh, IRS that is not only detailed comprehensively, but fundamentally contradicts the established but groundless narrative that this boarding school was a genocidal death camp, a whorehouse of adversity and abuse. Noteworthy is the fact that the enormous body of historical evidence in Green's website also reveals no evidence of any missing, neglected, and again, neglected can be defined in many different ways, but I would look at it as something that is uh, totally reprehensible, not potentially maybe your shirt being taken away, or murdered children. More particularly, it fundamentally contradicts the current fashionable but totally false genocide narrative. How is it possible that an education system, which was freely embraced by most indigenous people, could be called genocidal when it offered things like field trips, uh, photographs, dance, uh, dance troops, sports clubs, native languages and customs, ice rinks, swimming pools, all exclusively for its students. Now, was it perfect? Hell no. I'm sure they got a lot of things wrong, but those things sound like not something that uh, uh, operators of a death camp would be offering children. The most incendiary and least credible of these assertions by the commissioner's chair, the report that came out, Murray Sinclair, was the fact that 150,000 children who attended these mainly church-run schools between 1849 and 1996 were considered subhuman, a claim uh, which would totally go against the reason these schools existed, which was to give Aboriginal children the chance to acquire the knowledge and skills needed to fully benefit from membership in the new country of Canada. If the goal was physical genocide, as many assert, as a unanimous uh, 22, 2022 declaration from the Can Canadian House of Commons suggests, the results do not show it. Not one authenticated murder of a child at any IRS has ever been reported. Moreover, Aboriginal people in Canada now number over 1.5 million, or nearly 5% of the national population, a threefold increase since first contact. Seems like the folks running these schools got an F if their goal was genocide indeed. I put in links in the notes section to the Dorchester Review, a great site that tackles complex issues like these, as well as the link to the Indian Residential School Records website. Be sure to visit it, as it has a whole section, like I said, dedicated to what happened in Kamloops with respect to the mass grave story, and meticulously lays out the facts, as well the unanswered questions that are still lingering to date. Anyway, I thank you for watching. Uh, if you have any comments, please post them. You can also follow me on my Rumble and my Locals account. If you're on my Rumble's channel, please subscribe to it because uh, occasionally, um, you know what? YouTube just forgets about me or it says I don't exist and then you can't find it. And as well, check out some of my past videos and I will see you next time.